Hi there, here's a topic video looking at aspects of market failure and in particular government intervention to try to correct for negative externalities. In this topic video we're just going to take a quick look at some examples of regulation as a form of intervention. Regulation, otherwise known as command and control approaches, are attempts by governments to use the law to change the behaviour either of consumers or businesses in markets. Here are some examples. So, for example, the Health and Safety at Work Act covers all businesses. They have to comply to keep uh, basic safety in the workplace. The government has a renewables obligation certificate to encourage targets for renewable energy. Councils, local councils, might decide to use bylaws to prevent, for example, uh, people consuming drinks on the street outside pubs and clubs. There could be laws such as the ban on smoking in public places, which came in in 2007, which is widely regarded to have had a significant effect on, on people's behaviour and public health. Here's a really key one. The European Union has introduced a number of directives which have power at European level on, for example, how consumer durables such as cars, batteries, fridge freezers and uh, cookers should be disposed of safely as part of their environmental targets. The European Union also has tough rules on emissions targets from vehicles, which we're going to look at as a special feature in this topic video. Other regulations might include speed limits on the roads, weight limits for lorries, uh, as a policy to try and address overfishing, the EU imposes quotas on how much fishing can take place in European Union waters. And minimum ages for legal sale of certain products, such as cigarettes and alcohol. And regulations on the alcohol limit for, for drink driving. Uh, this was reduced in Scotland in 2014. So lots of examples here of how governments can introduce regulations as a way of trying to change behaviour in the market. If you need to add some examples to your notes, just press the pause button and we'll join you in a few seconds. OK, here's an example of, of regulations as a way of trying to cut emissions from cars. The European Union has adept, uh, used several policies to try and bring down emissions from vehicles. One of the biggest single causes, of course, of CO2. One of the, uh, one of the policies has been to introduce regulations on the maximum CO2 per kilometre travelled from vehicles. And over time, those regulations have become tougher. The maximum CO2 limit has been brought down. This is a command and control approach. And in 2015, there was a maximum of 130 grams per kilometre travelled. And quite significant penalties for car firms that, that uh, over, overtook, if you like, overtook the uh, emissions target. It has been quite effective in driving down innovation. Uh, the cap on emissions is, is higher than the actual for most uh, cars. So in other words, lots of companies staying within the emissions target. Uh, of course, we know that there's been some controversy with companies like Volkswagen using software to falsify their emissions. And that's quite a big issue that you can bring in as part of evaluation. One of the dangers with regulations is it might limit, uh, so the maximum limit might shift some foreign investment outside of the EU. That's, that's a, a trade-off that the European Union has to, has to think about. But regulations do seem to have been fairly effective in bringing down emissions per kilometre travelled. We'll look at some data on that in a second. Uh, an alternative to using regulation would be to bring vehicles, car makers, into the emissions trading scheme. This is a, a pollution trading scheme which has been in place in Europe since 2005. So, for example, there's a cap on carbon emissions and allowances, producers of cars, for example, could trade their allowances. In theory, a carbon trading scheme provides an incentive, a market-based incentive, for investment in lower carbon technologies because the producers who are most efficient uh, can produce their output without using up all of their allowances, and therefore they, they can then go to the market and sell some of their surplus allowances. However, one of the problems is that there's been a collapse in the price of the uh, carbon trading permits, somewhere like €5 Euros per tonne at the moment, which is well below the sort of generally perceived level which would, which would really incentivise a low-carbon investment. A third approach, if you want to address emissions from cars, we talked about regulations, we talked about pollution trading. A third approach is to impose higher road and fuel taxes. In other words, bring in the classic polluter pays principal tax. Well, a high road and fuel taxes, uh, if the demand for fuel is inelastic, they're going to generate significant revenues, either for national governments or for the European Union as a whole. 
These taxes are fairly easy to collect and the rates can be adjusted to meet changing needs. Crucially, a tax depends on actual fuel consumption of a vehicle, not theoretical levels, which of course could be falsified as we've seen with Volkswagen. However, a fuel tax cannot guarantee a specific reduction in emissions. What it does, of course, is it lifts the private cost of using cars and therefore tries to encourage uh, car users to buy cars that are more fuel efficient doesn't guarantee a specific reduction in emissions. So here are three different approaches you could use, one of which is regulation. Actually, there's been some quite significant progress in your opinion and in cutting emissions. This chart shows average uh, carbon dioxide emissions from just from new cars in the UK over the last 10 years or so. And as you can see, measured in terms of grams per kilometer traveled, there has been a sizable and significant fall in emissions. So policy interventions seem to have worked. The car industry as a whole is producing greener, more fuel efficient vehicles, and that's to be welcomed. Let's just think about the evaluation side of these kind of questions. So regulation is an alternative to uh, taxation as, a, as an instrument for collecting market failure. What is the case for introducing more regulations? I think there's really three points to, to make. One is that regulations can be quite a significant spur to business innovation. If a business knows that the regulations are going to be pretty tough and that the penalties are severe if they're breached, then in theory that's quite a big incentive to fast forward investment, research and development into, for example, low carbon technologies. It's also a way of trying to cut pollution in, in factories, for example. Uh, regulations tend to be better if demand is unresponsive to price changes. So an evaluation point you could make in an exam is that perhaps regulation is a better alternative if the price elasticity of demand for a polluting product is fairly low. And of course, with regulations, you can squeeze them every year. You can tighten and toughen the regulations gradually as we go on. And this could help to stimulate capital investment spending in industries affected. However, of course, there's always disadvantages. It's part of your critical evaluation. So here are some of the costs of adding to regulation of industries. First of all, there could be a quite a significant cost of enforcing these laws, administering the regulations, oftentimes involving employing lots of civil servants and testers, for example. That's part, part, that's part and parcel, by the way, of having a regulatory environment. Regulations can lead to some unwelcome unintended consequences. So when we come to look at government failure, we'll think about some examples of where regulations cause uh, some side effects, people to try and bypass the regulations. And that makes them less effective and as a cause of government failure. And one can make a case for saying that big businesses are better placed to meet regulations. Um, for example, health and safety laws and that kind of stuff. The, the cost of regulation and red tape can in, can in practice be quite a significant barrier to smaller businesses, some of whom might be forced out of the market. And that, of course, leads to less competition, less contestability, and perhaps, ultimately, higher prices for consumers. So here are some of the arguments for supporting regulation and some of the arguments thinking about some of the downsides of regulation. Either way, regulation is an alternative to using pollution taxes, for example, as a way of correcting for market failure. And it's worth considering as part of your analysis and evaluation. Thanks for joining us.